there are kind of like three segments in the video. Um, the first one is the coffee culture, us and the disconnect. So we've built industries, massive industries, corporations that have set up locations in the global north. You have restaurant chains that revolve around selling you a nice cheap cup of coffee. And it's very standardized, it's very normalized, and it's very, very accessible. There's a simple exchange between the consumer, which would be myself, and the producer, or what I perceive as the producer. And that would be the person that is producing the cup of coffee. But that is where the disconnect really lies. And that's where the real story, where the issues kind of begin. Consumption in the developed world, American, European, and Japanese drinkers consume more than half of the world's coffee, but that rate is flatlining. Though in developing countries such as China, Indonesia, and Brazil, where the emerging middle classes are discovering the joys of coffee, the market is growing around 5% a year. But Robusta is the bean of choice. The point of this video is to bridge the gap between the cherry that has grown on the coffee tree, the coffee plant, sorry, and figuring out the path that it takes and the amount of work that it takes to get into our little coffee mugs. And also the issues that fall into place, the contentious issues of coffee. So it kind of brings in the question, is coffee a stable commodity or is it is there a stable market for coffee there's a lot of competition and there's growing competition so the traditional coffee growing regions are in in latin america south america latin america are now having to compete with asia and different parts of asia and yeah Even though the climate and the geographic location is just right for growing coffee, farmers have been having a very difficult time. Large amounts of the coffee that we consume are still picked by hand. In fact, almost 95% of the coffee that is consumed in the world comes from small-scale farming. The issues arise with decreasing international prices. With more competition means... And also climate change, such as heavy rain. Finally, one of the worst issues affecting them is crop disease. Down in Santa's all say no, no, no The politician's daughter was accused of drinking water And was fined the great big $50 bill They've got an awful lot of coffee in Brazil In The Economist and Sun, there was an article published that actually states the opposite to what Frank Sinatra sings. In Brazil, which produces a third of the world's coffee beans, farmers are striking over the falling prices of sacks of coffee in protest. Later on in the article, the author also writes, to make matters worse for Arabica growers, falling prices have been accompanied by rising costs. Coffee is still largely picked by hand, and wages are rising fast in Brazil and Colombia. Many Brazilian and Colombian farmers invested to boost production of Arabica in response to high prices of, in 2011, 
which has added to the oversupply and further depressed prices. The Chiapas people live in an ideal farming area. And years prior to their protest, the government had slowly privatized the land and saw it and the inhabitants as an investment opportunity. The indigenous population ended up being separated from their land and became even more disadvantaged than before. They became increasingly militant due to the president revoking an agrarian reform which gashed the hopes of the indigenous people gaining the titles to their land. This led to the Zapatista uprising of 1994. Now to begin a little bit of a discussion on free trade. In theory, it advocates that globalization is an ultimately positive force. As seen through the implementation of trade agreements such as NAFTA and systematic changes being made to countries, efficiency and output will grow and the nation and the global economy will see an all-round benefit. With the ability to specialize in the production of a select item, resources can be better allocated and focused. The benefits of trade on a national level may be seen. A lot of neoclassical economists or a lot of people that work in the global economy look at GDP as a marker for how successful a country is, the gross domestic product. The whole country may produce more GDP, but large groups within the country, namely the workers, could still be worse off. It is not agreed on universally. Free trade, neoclassical theory, it's still highly debated among the academic community. But the reality is, that's also the system that we have in place now, and it is directly affecting and not benefiting all of the players. There are issues though when an academic theory is justified but has proven not to live up to its original claims. One of these theories is comparative advantage. In theory, as proposed by David Ricardo, freer trade reduces labor costs, it can supplement the profits of industrialists, which he perceived as a very dynamic force in society, and also reduced the power of unproductive landlords. Though, in his theory, everyone was employed and all of the resources are used in production. But in essence, that's not reality. Unemployment is, it really does exist, and in large numbers, and for long periods of time. When a country chooses to specialize, there's a large reallocation of resources and switching to new industries or to specialize for a product means that workers who worked in one sector may lose their jobs because the country chooses to focus on something else. The fair trade movement is one of the better solutions because it supports fair exchange. It supports equity and it also helps to sustain different non-capitalist ways of living or systems of, of interaction, of exchange. Since Latin America is the continent which has so strongly rejected neoliberal assumptions in all areas of economic and social life, it is not surprising that this is where non-neoliberal trade practices have been most successful. There are trade agreements in Latin America, one namely ALBA, which ALBA promotes greater regional trade 
the development of a common alternative currency and cooperation around development of ecological and humanitarian priority. Being associated with a fair trade organization also allows the farmers more autonomy. Um, it allows them to have more control and say, but also gives them more pride into their own product. The coffee justice movement also adds another perspective or adds more of a voice to the free market and how an unregulated economy is not entirely beneficial. Is it possible to conclude that small-scale farmers will see justice through the fair trade movement? That's a maybe. Um, it will be impossible to ensure that 100% of the small-scale farmers that are a part of these organizations or to ensure that all small-scale farmers in Colombia or Latin America or other coffee-growing regions are being paid equitably and that their work conditions are safe.